Hand mic. Hand mic. So we yeah, have yeah. Ah, because of okay. So we can ask. I, I, I prefer this as well. Yeah. The, which which okay. mic like you it. prefer? This one or the? the and here is second speaker. Yeah? So it I could be. The headset, yeah. You can wear wear the headset before. Okay. During the questions. Okay. Just to go. Through. How to turn it on? Yeah. It, it, it's everything. Uh, Jo, to je tam dej. Okay, I think it's time to start. I hope you enjoyed the dinner. Uh, my name is Bartosz Belter. I'm from Poznan Supercomputing and Networking Center, uh, the operator of the Polish NREN. Uh, welcome all of you to the session dedicated to the discussion on dynamic network services. 
it's somehow a continuation of, of the session we had just before lunch in, in this room. Um, and I believe the, the continuation is that we, we have some links between the two sessions. Before we start with the technical uh, discussions, I would like to refer to the first uh, plenary session we had today. We had a, the, the talk from CTO of Juniper. Uh, he explained the architectural principles for building new uh, network architectures. And the third principle for, for that was, uh, it said, says, automate everything you can automate in your, ne your network. I believe that with this session we, we will be able to address this paradigm. We have three speakers today. The first speaker, Inder Monga, he's a senior uh, researcher. He's leading the research uh, activities in SNET. He's co-chair of NSI working group, and he will be presenting the results of, of this group, the, of work of, in this group. The second speaker, Jeroen van der Ham, he's a researcher at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, he's active also at OGF. He's contributing to the NML working group. He will, present, he will be presenting challenges in uh, topology exchange. And the final, uh, the last uh, presenter is Reza Najbati. He's a senior researcher at University of Essex. He's uh, coordinating the research activities in high performance networking group. Uh, he's also leader of virtualization task in Jant. And he will present the virtualization service for Jant and NREN community. So now, uh, Inder, the mic is yours. Thank you. I think uh, they want me to use the hand mic, so it's fine. This is yours. Okay, great. Thank you. Hello. Hello. So I'm going to give a talk on uh, network services interface and uh, going to focus more on what are the concepts, motivation, rather than going to the details. The details can be got from the specifications and, and the multiple discussions that have happened within the OGF. Um, I list my co-chairs, but uh, there have a lot of people in the RNNE community who have participated in developing the concepts, and some of them are here. So uh, this work is, is actually community work. It's uh, not an individual individual work that I'm presenting. So the first I'm going to talk about is abstraction. So the whole thing about services and the service interface, the important thing to know is that this is about abstraction, about presenting a complex infrastructure in a simple mechanism so people can uh, make, make part, it part of their, you know, their architecture, their applications. And uh, you know, if if you, if you have a lot of complexity, uh, as as the cartoon says, uh, it's it's bound to fail. So it doesn't mean that you cannot <coughs> deal with complexity. It's how to take the complexity and abstract it into a simple set of objects that you can work with. So I take an example. The Unix socket interface actually was the most successful data plane abstraction, and that is what has caused you know, the proliferation of TCP IP. Why everybody uses TCP IP is one of the big causes is this socket. Uh, and this socket interface actually, uh, from an application perspective, a client in the service, server process when they want to communicate on a computer, uh, I don't know if how many people have done socket programming, so they may not remember this, uh, uh, this, you know, all you do is you create a socket by saying, you know, uh, what kind of uh, access AF, AF INET, which is internet, and you can uh, choose a type and a protocol. And if it is type is SOC stream, you know, the protocol is assumed to be TCP uh, by default. So it's very simple for a client process, for an application to create a socket and it gives back uh, something which is like a file descriptor. So you read uh, or write into that descriptor. So it's very simple for the application to use it. And what this does is it hides all this complexity. If you look at the complexity, there is a protocol layer and a device layer on a computer, and then there is a network which, you know, if you look at it, it is 6,000 ITF RFCs, IEEE standards, and ITU documents. Uh, you know, the same socket concept is used by mobile devices. So all of that gets abstracted into the socket layer from a data plane perspective. And, and, and that, that is what caused 
the wide adoption of TCP IP. So what is it from abstracting the network capabilities from a control plane perspective? So for example, if you desired network services an end-to-end multi-domain, and, and I put dynamic in brackets, a multi-domain circuit with guarantees. Now, you can have bandwidth guarantees or you can have connectivity guarantees, and we heard the speakers before that bandwidth on demand is not necessarily uh, the thing. We need to move on to topology on demand. So if the desired network service is what is required from a control plane, and you want to connect multiple networks together, multi-domains with uh, uh, multiple policies, what is the right abstraction to set up this circuit for an application? And what is the right abstraction to view this multi-domain topology? And that is some of the challenges which the Network Services Group started to address and start, started to tackle. I'm going to talk about the right abstractions to set up the circuit for an application, and my following speaker, Yaron, will talk about topology. So. The basis of network service architecture was the service concept. You know, and service concept means there is a requester asking for a service from a provider. So whether it's a connection service to set up a connection, a monitoring service to monitor an existing uh, connection, a measurement service to do measurements on your infrastructure and expose that information, the prime motivation between the architecture was a service. Again. There was a per user domain interface, so a user or a requester could ask, make a service request of the network. So how the network actually satisfied the service request was not something that the user or the domain needed to do. So it simplified, you know, whether that service provider was going to talk to 15 other networks or 200 resources or use MPLS or whatever to provide that service is not something that the service requester really needs to know. And that abstraction into a simple to understand service request, which again, I'm putting it in English, uh, but it, is, it will be in XML. You know, I want guaranteed 10 gigabits per second Ethernet connection from point A to point Z between 10 AM to 12 PM. Now, you don't have to give a schedule. You can ask it for all time. Uh, you, know, you don't have to ask for 10 gigabits per second. You can just ask for a VLAN. So there are a lot of flexibilities there, but it is a simple request. Now, if you look at the cloud world, they have also gone the same way. You know, with Amazon EC2, you're essentially saying, give me five servers for two days, and I want to run my computation, and then I give it up. So what you see is that if you want to build the cloud storage and compute world together with the network world, this is the kind of interface the network needs to build in order to bring it together. So the vision is much larger than just multi-domain bandwidth on demand, which has been demonstrated to the community. It is to build resources together and to be able to simultaneously uh, you know, uh, provision and, and co-schedule resources. So let's talk about the concept of a service plane. So there is a concept of a transport plane, which contains all data planes, so multi-layer capable. It doesn't talk at a single layer, layer one, layer two, or layer three. And a service plane where there is a requester with an NSI interface and a provider. The control plane and the management plane are all abstracted and represented within the service plane. So you don't have to deal with them directly. And the network, if, uh, if you look at it on the right-hand side, is modeled as a set of endpoints, which are external endpoints, and a transfer function. And what that means is that there is connectivity between the points. It talks about bandwidth available between the points. And that's represented as a transfer function, not how it was implemented and what technology is, it is used to implement. So let me talk a little bit about how this really works conceptually. So there is conversation between a service requester and a service provider over this network services interface. The requester agent, or RA, is contained within a software entity, which is called a network services agent. So there is a requester agent and a provider agent. The same software entity, network services agent, can have both requester agents and provider agents as part of it. The network services, the multiple network services I talked about, like connection service, monitoring service, measurement service, topology service, can be services that are offered by this network services agent on top of this NSI or network services interface. 
there is a concept of NRM, or Network Resource Manager. And um, what the Network Resource Manager does is fully own local resources that it has authority over and is able to provision that. The network services communicate to each other, that is, send requests and get responses over this NSI interface or the network services interface. So if there are multiple services being offered by a network services agent, they use the same interface, the network service interface. So there is, uh, you know, you don't have to come up with new protocols for communication for every little service that you implement. You now they may have their own semantics, but you don't have to come up with the new transport protocol. And then the transport plane, which is a set of physical resources in the network, are provisioned by these NRMs based on a service request, and, and you get connectivity. And once you get connectivity, you use the data plane abstractions to actually send the data. So this is, in short, the concepts in the network services framework document. So if I cull, there's a lot of concepts which are similar to what people have done. There are three important concepts, I think, which I wanted to explain further, which are kind of three pillars of, of, the, of this new standard. One is there is a recursive framework. There is an abstraction of topology and, and, and a model where multiple services can be composed. So I'll talk about that a little bit more. So what is the recursive framework? The, rec the recursive framework actually says that you have a concept of a service requester and a provider, but that can recurse over a lot of different domains. So if you have a requester A who wanted to put an end-to-end -end service together and send a request to provider agents B, C, and D, which is what you call the tree model. It's like a leaves of, uh, branches of a tree. B, C, and D, in turn, can talk to networks E, F, and G, or H, I, and J. And I can, in turn, talk to K, L, and M to put this end-to-end -end service together. But the ultimate requester A doesn't need to be aware of that comp uh, complexity. Each interface between A, B, A, C, and A, D is the same NSI interface. And so is the interface between B, E, E, F, and F, G. So this whole model can recurse to provide an end-to-end -end service without changing the complexity, semantics, or the context. You're aware that in, in some of the work which has gone in the internet before, you have the concept of UNI, ENI, INNI, depending on the context. And they actually change the protocols depending on what the context is. In this, we tried hard to keep the protocol semantics the same, no matter whether there was a user or a network talking to a network, or an external interface, or an internal interface, it is the same interface. So if you implement it, the, the differentiation is only in the policies internal. It is not in, in the communication protocol. I wanted to talk about the abstraction of topology. We have RNE networks here which are implementing uh, networks which are purely based on circuits, purely based on layer two, or, or IP routed and MPLS uh, circuits. We wanted at the service plane to abstract that multi-layer topology, and we called it a service termination point. Now, service termination point is not actually a physical endpoint, but it represents the external interfaces of a domain. And, and when I mean it represents, it's a symbolic reference. It's a set of strings which actually point to an endpoint. And how it points to an endpoint is actually the concern of the domain itself. But from a service plane perspective, it simplifies setting up connections between endpoint from, an, from a user perspective, because all they need is to know the STPs which they want to connect. Now, whether that VLAN gets converted into a GFP MAC Ethernet circuit or how the technology changes from domain to domain is really not the concern of the requester of the end user. The STP or the service demarcation point actually points to two STPs which are connected. So you know that from a path finding perspective, can you really make a path or not? If there are two disparate technologies, they cannot be connected together, then there won't be an SDP, which indicates that there can be a uh, cross-domain connection. So if you want to set up in the transport plane from host to host connection, and you have multiple endpoints and networks, they will be represented in the service plane as STPs and SDPs in this manner, which will allow you to create a service path 
from one, one end to another end. And that's also a differentiating concept in the NSI. The third one is the ability to combine services. Because we have the same interface and multiple services can ride on top of it, you can create a bunch of atomic services or basic network services, a connection service, a topology service, a monitoring service, a protection service. Uh, one of the concepts which I've been talking about is you don't need protection all the time. I mean, if you want bandwidth for a certain time for a certain connection, you may want it protection also for that uh, little amount of time. Why do you have to provision it all the time? So if you have these different nuggets of services, someone who's setting up an automated goal service, which is being done in the Glyph, can say an automated goal service is actually a combination of connection, verification, topology, and monitoring service. And I'll make a plug for verification. I think Jerry has an end-to-end -end verification buff sometime today. Yeah. So you can create, if you created a ver ver verification service, you could combine that and call it, that's the service I want. So from a user perspective, when there is a composed service, he doesn't need to request each service individually. He actually asks for the composed service. The composed service provides an API that he deals with. And how the, composable, how the composed service actually passes the information to the individual services is upon that, uh, upon that service itself. So it simplifies it again for the user to get a complex service. And again, this is congruent with the end-to-end -end vision where you can bring campus and the WAN together because each of, uh, uh, each of those components may provide these services differently or implement them differently, but they can provide an end-to-end -end service and you know whether you can get monitoring end-to-end -end or not. So the first NSI service that we are going to specify is actually the connection service. It is the creation, management, and removal of connections, so the whole connection lifecycle. It's a set of, the connection service protocol is a set of messages exchanged over the NSI interface to manage this service, and it does leverage the recursive architecture of the network service agents to set up this end-to-end -end connection. I'm going to give you an example. There are five primitives, which is reserve, provision, release, cancel, and query. And uh, this little animation shows how this protocol works conceptually. So there is a reserve which is sent from the requester to the provider who sends a confirm. There is a start time when that connection was reserved for. But it is not one of the other differences in NSI is the connection doesn't have to be provisioned by the start time by the provider. He doesn't have to do that. He waits for an explicit provision command from the user. The use case being is you may, pro you may reserve resources, but until the user is ready to actually use them, why bring up the circuit and keep it active? So when the user sends a provision, and this provision can happen actually before the start time too, that's when uh, the network actually gets provisioned, and the circuit or the connection comes in service. The user may release it, but still keep the reservation. He may use those resources or local resources for some other purpose. So he may still keep uh, the, the reservation across the multi-domain uh, in his name, but release, release the provisioned resources, do something else, and come back and provision it again to get it back in service. So these are some of the concepts that are in the connection service protocol. And the duration of reservation is separated from the actual use of resources. There are two documents in progress. One has already been published as an OGF standards document. It's called GFT 173. It's a network services framework. That was the initial part of my talk. And you can access the document through the link. The connection service protocol is something in progress. Uh, we are close, and, and I, I keep saying close because we are very close to finishing the document. We have a sample WSDL that has been shared, and there are some comments on it which we are trying to resolve and hopefully publish the document very soon. Uh, we are looking for developers to implement this pre-standard 1.0 specification uh, so we can do some kind of protocol interoperability slash demo later this year. And, and I would really, really want to extend my thanks to the hardworking NSI contributors. It's a very active group with worldwide contributors from Japan, from US, from Europe. Um, there is a conference call every week for one and a half hours that everybody j hops on and participates.
There are lots of offline discussions, both Skype and face-to-face. -face, and there are interim face-to-face -face meetings that are scheduled on top of uh, OGF meetings. So this is something which not just me as a co-chair, but the entire community feels important, and they're contributing a lot of time to it. And we welcome more participation to make, it, make sure that it meets all the requirements of the community. I wanted to put this slide up. Why does NSI matter? I think I talked about the protocol. I, I need to talk uh, about why it matters. Bill talked about the IDC protocol, and there was some questions in the previous thing. So the DICE IDCP protocol is implemented by a few major networks in US and Europe, and it is interoperable, but not all. It has demonstrated unequivocally the power when this capability is operationalized. The LHC traffic is running uh, on this capability right now. And it clearly shows that if you have interoperability between such setup, it can be really powerful. There is a paper in IEEE Communications Magazine on hybrid networks, lesson learned and future challenges, which talk about how we want to move forward. And I think NSI's protocol is a step forward in this direction. The service plane concepts and the NSI architecture actually transcend the underlying infrastructure and capability changes. You know, people are going to be implementing new networks all the time. And you know, they change from their optical gear to a layer two gear to a carrier ethernet gear to MPLS. You change the underlying topology. You don't want to change the service model for your users every time you change the underlying topology. So this abstraction really helps you take new technological advances and put it in your network without worrying about how the users are going to uh, deal with that. And the right abstractions should lead to multiple constituent services and adoption by r &E applications. So what we really want to go is to standardize the service layer so new applications can be built which are right for the r &E community. It's not an easy challenge. It's easy to say it in words right here. But this can be the basis of an r &E programmable platform, and that's what we feel. So as a summary, service plane is an abstraction of multi-layer, multi-domain network capabilities for users, applications, and network administrators. The network services interface is the basic interface between a requester agent and a provider agent to request and get network services. Composable services is an ability to create a higher layer customized service with these multiple network services that ride over the NSI layer. Connection service is the first network service being defined, and being, uh, that work is being carried out by the NSI group. We feel topology service is very important, and that's a candidate for the next NSI service. And hopefully, the next speaker after me will uh, add, add his thoughts on that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Inder, for your uh, very good presentation and for a good timing. Uh, now it's time for questions. Are there any questions for the speaker? Thank you very much. OK, I have a question to you. Oh, okay. uh, I just made a note. You mentioned the clouds uh, at the beginning of your talk as a potential client of the interface. Uh, I'm wondering how flexible the interface is in terms of adding new attributes, uh, parameters in the request. An example by putting more cloud-oriented parameters inside the request. Are you dealing only with the network part or plan to extend it? So the way I see it is that the cloud, when you make a request, you assume there is a WAN infrastructure in place which will get you to the data center. The request you make is actually to configure the data center resources. We feel that this is, can be done along with it, so I don't need to make it a cloud-specific interface. But it is in terms of co-scheduling. I co-scheduling my WAN with my data center resources because in the end, I'm sitting on a campus and I need to get to the data center. People forget that a lot of times. And when you forget that, when you see bad performance or things don't work, you may blame the cloud provider, but it could be your network in between. So really, in order to provide a guaranteed end-to-end -end service, you need to include both of these requests. But they have been made at the right level of abstraction, so you can do that without having to think differently. It's web services like interface. OK, thank you very much. There is a question. I'm having a little trouble seeing the utility of the release of the release function in the sense that if you build the network 
underlying network in such a way that it 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 it, it can be shared in the sense that um, capacity not used by the reservation is available to non-reservation uses, then I'm not sure what the point of release is. And if, if you have something like uh, a TDM-based network underneath, how can you release it and then guarantee that you get it back unless you don't use it anyway? So I'm having a little trouble figuring out where, where this is a useful uh, construct. The reason that release and provision were included was more from an end site perspective where they could have multiple applications riding over the link between the campus and the van. That is where um, there was a thing about time sharing those, those resources and where you may want to release capacity even though it is TDM. Your reservation mechanism needs to obviously deal with it that you can get your uh, resources back. Um, which means you can't allocate it to another circuit. I, I, the, part of the discussion was that there would be times when you would, there would be times uh, where you would want to release the circuit so that it was formally not in service anymore, but you don't want to release the, the reservation that was reserving the, the capacity. This could be, you know, maybe you detected an error and you wanted the operators to look at it or the engineers to, to do some testing. So, you don't. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 the the use you know, we, case. We, we kind of tortured ourselves on that thing question. I mean, so don't, yeah, it's so the use case is, Bill, is that we're talking of a multi-domain reservation. Yeah, it, it's just, just a matter of, you know, you provision it, and, and you may have to take it out of service for some reason. We didn't really have, uh, we, we kind of came up with some reasons that, yeah, we might have to fix Maintenance something. was one, yeah. circuit by internet to uh, level three going down because yeah, something. Yeah, so, yeah, you, you don't want to destroy somebody's reservation that they've had for a year just because all of a sudden you have to take it down to fix something. Right. I propose to continue the discussion offline, and now we have the next speaker, Jeroen. Thank you. So I have a, a presentation on challenges in topology exchange in, uh, for emerging network services. Um, as Inder mentioned, topology exchange is, a, is an important service. Um, I'd like to mention, to point out that the, the, this particular talk and the extended abstract was carried by uh, five different institutions and four of the different authors are here right now. So um, we think this is a very important concept that we have to discuss. And I also have a slightly a mixed message. On the one hand, I want to push people to, to do topology exchange. And on the other hand, I want to explain why topology exchange is hard and why we aren't done yet. Um, so first of all, we have a lot of network resources and we like to, uh, different um, uh, networks like to show visually what kind of resources we have. This is important to, to explain what we do, um, what is available um, and, and uh, how it can be used. So uh, these kinds of diagrams are important and in a way they also help engineers understand how the network fits together. Um, Unfortunately, diagrams are very hard to understand for a computer. So that doesn't help us much. Um, traditionally, many years ago, network provisioning was you had uh, a network and you had an end user who understood how the network fit together and asked for a specific path through the network to the endpoint. And then he used phone and email to contact the network operator. And the network operator would use um, his own knowledge based on the diagrams that he found on the internet and uh, contacts that he had with other other networks um, to contact them using phone and email um, to set up their networks. Um, we want to move to a, a situation where we can just have an end user say, I want to go there and um, remove the, the, the phone and email and just make it an automated system that we uh, um, 
that people can use to provision their network services. However, we will need to have uh, a representation of the network f so that the systems can understand, can figure out where that other endpoint is. So, um, we need network descriptions to provide an overview of resources, um, to make path discovery easier. Um, uh, the the interdomain systems will have to have some knowledge of other uh, uh, networks in order to know where to go. Um, we can we can do path discovery without topology exchange, but it's going to be a hell of a lot easier if you have some kind of topology representation. Um, and also, it makes for very simple. Um, it topology representation allows you to do very simple problem detection, because then you can have a um, um, you have a system that knows what the uh, um, what the what the um, what the path looks like through the network in relation to the whole network, and then uh, it makes it also easier for the engineers to communicate to each other so that they know exactly which point that you're looking at um, and that they're talking about the same thing. Um, and to to add to this that we that topology exchange is also important is that we've had a very successful demo um, which is called the automated goal it was referenced before I think. Um, we've had several different institutions ranging from Amsterdam all the way through to um, Chicago, the, U and the rest of the US, uh, I think it's New York, all the way to Tokyo. Um, and we were able to do automatic provisioning um, through the uh, a, a pre-NSI interface um, so that we could get connections, circuits up between all kinds of different institutions um, using this automatic process. Um, and this spanned 13 different time zones, and all we had to show for it was this. We had a matrix which was showing green lights in, s in certain spots, um, and um, yes, green lights. We had green lights to show in certain spots, and um, with just a little bit more effort, we had tools available to make these kinds of visualizations, where we have a uh, uh, Google Map. Um, where we have a Google Map or uh, a Google Earth visualization that was made by the uh, people from KDDI. Um, or even just a simple Google Earth visualization which shows the which kind of connections. These are, uh, this also shows the delays um, and uh, the colors show some of the status of the different links. But these kind of visualizations can only be built if we have uh, representations of topologies. Now, um, to do topology exchange, there are different kinds of method methodologies to um, to distribute them. We can do a direct commu communication between different domains. Um, uh, so I'm what I mean by that is that each domain contacts each other domain to get the topology. So you get a uh, whole broadcast domain uh, that each of them is, is uh, contact the other. Uh, another option is that you do peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, so you, you only contact your neighbors and uh, you um, uh, exchange the different uh, topologies that you have available to yourself so that you build, to you build together a, a, world, a view of the whole world. Um, you could do a hierarchical tree like in uh, in OSPF, um, and another that's been uh, um, another method that's been proposed a lot is the path vector protocol, um, like that is used in uh, BGP. Unfortunately, we can't really use path vector protocols because for most of the circuit-based networkings, we don't have an addressing scheme. There is no global addressing scheme for the, for light path endpoints. So it's going to be very hard to do a, a path vector protocol without the addressing scheme. Um, the scalability is also mentioned as a, as a uh, point that's going to be very hard. On the one hand, things are 
are um, easier for for the um, uh, circuit-based network uh, network pathfinding because in the normal internet and intranets the the pathfinding is it is done by the network element and it has to be done near instant all the time because you're forwarding packets all the time and um, the moment you you get a packet you have to make a split second decision on where you want to get the packet to go in circuit networks you can um, uh, you can do the the path computation uh, offline or even out of line um, you can do it in a separate element which is what I meant by that um, and you can do it you do it only once before you do each circuit setup uh, so it doesn't have to be available in near instant you can you can have a few seconds delay to to compute the answer um, and also you can have more um, powerful machines available to do the uh, uh, to do the computation you can just use commodity hardware that's that you can add CPUs and more memory to do the uh, computation um, to make problems simpler we can also do topology aggregation you can re represent a, a network um, that is very complex you don't need to all the details about the internal topology um, uh, what Inder mentioned also already is the transfer function which is basically uh, a, um, a point where you have a central node that uh, represents the connectivity in the in the um, uh, in the internal network or you can have a full mesh representation where the domain also um, uh, broadcasts the availability of the intra domain uh, paths um, and a final option is just to collapse the whole network into a node um, the only problem with this is that it, this doesn't give you any uh, information about the interno internal availability uh, of the paths um, that doesn't really matter that much if you have enough availability to make sure that everything can be can go through the network but as soon as things become popular and your network starts to fill up then you will have uh, uh, false positives uh, from the pathfinding um, and this will make the pathfinding somewhat e uh, somewhat harder um, another complexity is in that um, um, is explained by this example we ha this is a, a historical example the, the problem doesn't exist anymore um, but we had we can we found this that we wanted to have a light path from the University of Amsterdam to the University of Quebec um, using gigabit Ethernet um, and uh, Netherlight, Manland, Chicago and CNET were all uh, connected using uh, uh, Sonnet the only problem was that the the adaptation here into STS 3C 7V was not compatible with the STS 24C that was happening there so um, there was also some network in use so there were also other constraints that ha that um, came with this pathfinding um, so we want to go from the Amsterdam to Quebec the pro so the different adaptations from uh, STS to STS here make this path impossible you have to do um, uh, uh, a readaptation uh, and a translation between the two different STS methods um, and then the other problem is that this this link is almost full we only have 22 slots free and this adaptation that's done uh, that's converted here takes up 24 slots while the other one just takes 21 and then the final solution is that you have you go from here and then you go up here you traverse this link this way and you translate into 24 and go back up and then you end up in the University of Quebec um, so this shows that it's uh, that pathfinding can be very complex and that it's not straightforward we, c we can't just use simple dextras to solve these kinds of problems um, so we have multiple constraints the constraints are in the path itself um, you can like I showed in the example before you can only use the link with the 22 slots 
if you're doing uh, if you have the the um, the three C seven V adaptation. Um, so it the how you can use the path. It depends on what kind of adaptation you've been using. Um, and the solutions to this is either hope for the best and just do the calculation, or we have to do heuristic algorithms. Um, <coughs> the point, however, is that if we start doing heuristic algorithms, we have to know some uh, some of the properties of uh, um, multilayer networks. We have to know what kind of multilayer networks there are, what kind of adaptations are available, what are mostly used, and how networks look like. So we need those kind of uh, um, topology descriptions in order to figure out how to do pathfinding in those networks uh, and to prepare for the future. Some open issues in topology exchange is uh, security. Um, right now we have no idea basically what the security uh, um, constraints are for people describing their networks. Are, are networks um, uh, forward about just describing their whole topology? Do they want to um, make topology only available for certain people? Um, are there uh, kind of uh, secret details of the topology that you don't want others to know? We have no idea about these things right now. Um, Another issue is trust. How can I know that if if we're using a peer-to-peer -peer exchange where I get a description of the topology from my neighbor, how do I know that that's really true? And even if it seems to be coming directly from my neighbor, what if there's a man-in-the-middle attack and, and somebody's changing the topology? Um, the updating frequency, if we're going to um, describe the use of the network uh, inside the policies, um, and we have to update them each each time to show the current use of the network. Um, what kind of frequency do we have to update them with? Right now, we don't know um, because we're not doing it, and we have no data to figure out what the, what the optimal frequency is. Um, and then, right now, a virtualization is a is a new uh, issue that's coming up. Um, we see a lot of virtualization happening, uh, virtual networking. Uh, there are a lot of projects that are using virtual machine uh, um, moving. Um, and you get different kind of networks. So this opens up a whole new can of worms that, that you get all kinds of different, more complex networks. And how are we going to deal with this in the, uh, in the topology descriptions? Um, and then uh, one last thing is that I hope that we can do we can start doing topology exchange so we can have an enhanced understanding because um, uh, topology exchange is not only useful for automating the whole process of provisioning it's required to do that but it also helps immensely with monitoring uh, so that systems can understand what the network looks like and they can help correlate problems with the um, the circuits that are uh, taken through the network and, and put them into perspective. So that's what I wanted to discuss. Any questions? Any questions? Please? Uh, Dave Wilson, BGP addict. Um, you mentioned there's no addressing system for circuits. Should we make one? Um, combined with the virtualization aspects that are, that are coming and becoming more prevalent, um, I don't think it's possible to do to do uh, um, really uh, a numbering for obstacle networks. And also, you you get Systems that are usually not connected to the internet, but only connected in intranets. So you have a cluster, um, then you have a project that you connect one cluster to a supercomputer in, in Tokyo, um, and you start doing combined uh, um, computations. There is no uh, these kinds of um, ad hoc 
um, uh, cooperations happen often, and I don't think that we can really do an, an, um, a numbering scheme that will work for these kind of projects. I'm Jerry Sobieski. I'm one of the authors. Right. So um, I'm going to take a little bit different uh, position than Yeroon and say that I think I think there's a way we can do it. Right. This is part of the discussion that's going to ensue over the next several months or a year in some of the NSI topology discussions. Um, the way the way we're seeing some of this evolve right now is that there there's a there is a um, a very rudimentary hierarchical way of, of identifying networks and the potential endpoints in those networks. And in, in that manner you can you you can actually do something that's akin to numbering, but it's it's really still a, a symbolic, you know, labeling. You're 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 basically building a, a hierarchy so you can you can do some um, um, summarization. So I can say anything that's in that network I know because he sent me his you know, right, right. That network is over we're, there. We're, I mean, we're doing the, the identification scheme uh, and we're building globally unique uh, identifiers. Yeah. Um, but in order to do path vector protocols, you have to be able to, to aggregate different domains saying uh, um, if you want to go this way, or if you want to go to that range of things, then you have to go that way. and. Uh, globally unique identifiers don't necessarily have that uh, have that property, um, and you you do need that. Ah. Okay. Any other questions to the speaker? If not, thank you very much, Jeroen, for your presentation and. The <laughs> the next speaker, Reza Najbati, from University of Essex. and uh, I am leading the virtual assistant task in Giant, Giant 3, which is one of the research activity in Giant, which is uh, the objective is to propose uh, what is the best potential solution for the virtualization of next generation Giant network, uh, which is, we call it GRA1 task 4, which is a very small task. So I am going to <coughs> report on behalf of this task what we have done so far and our development on the virtual service for Gion and European NRN, which we call it as a short genus, uh, which is a virtual system for uh, Gion and European NRN. Uh, what I'm going uh, in this presentation to explain is first uh, a little bit uh, uh, look what does it mean infrastructure virtualization. If you go around the literature you or the different projects and different uh, continents or countries, you will find uh, everybody has his own view on infrastructure virtualization. Then I, I try to explain what is the motivation uh, from the operator and both NRM point of view uh, to go toward infrastructure virtualization. Then I enter to the uh, Geon3 activity and approach on infrastructure virtualization. We took a quite unique approach on this, which I explained the reason behind and what is this approach. And then uh, I explained the genus architecture, which is the virtualization architecture of Geon. And then uh, I explained what role an actor in the creative and NREN deployed genus system. And then I explained what is our plan for implementation and proof of concept and uh, use case. Well, what is infrastructure virtualization? Basically, if you want to explain it, you can explain it in two words. It's either a slicing or an aggregation. By a slicing, it uh, means that if you have, a, for example, a big switch, router or uh, network element, if you can manage somehow to divide it to a smaller one, which they can work independently is important. They can work independently in an isolated way, way then you have a slice it. You have seen this, uh, the same concept in the, opti in the computer science or computer domain virtual machine concept is clear. Example of the slicing virtualization. 
Then uh, you have an aggregation, which we see if you can uh, in the previous talk, for example, was the example of the uh, virtualization. If you can present a domain as aggregated and be present as a single uh, switching domain that can be controlled by an administrative entity, then you have virtualized it. You have seen this in the cluster environment. If you have a several a small computer, you put it under a cluster manager, or uh, uh, then you have a, a bigger uh, computing power, we call it a virtual computer. So in terms of the network virtualization, we have a router switch virtualization, bandwidth and connectivity virtualization. Then virtualization can be divided in different layers. We have a layer one photonic virtualization, which is a contra controversial point of view on how to virtualize the analog system. Then we have a la layer two virtualization, which is Ethernet, VLAN, console well developed. And we have a layer three virtualization, uh, a more advanced version of the VPN. Then we have IT virtualization, which is very, uh, very well uh, studied and developed, which is uh, you have a hardware virtualization, network-based virtualization, uh, computer virtualization, uh, and the computing and storage virtualization. Now, slicing and aggregation, both of them, they make for you infrastructure virtualization. And at the end of the day, uh, uh, an, inf an infrastructure virtualized, when, when you have a whole set of the infrastructure, which in a, in a new uh, generation of the uh, infrastructure is a network process at the edge computing or storage resources attached to that, then you can uh, slice them or aggregate them and then operate them independently. For example, if these big boxes are, are the real uh, switching or routing devices, and then if we can manage to partition them to the small uh, colored uh, switching devices or colored uh, uh, computing system, then we ma if we manage somehow to create an isolated network and give it to a user which can operate it independently as it has a physical network, then we can call it, we have virtualized, uh, we have a virtualized infrastructure. Now, in, in Giant, we have, a, uh, we have come up with a definition of the virtualization which is agreed among the partners which is in the context of a network and computing infrastructure, virtualization is creation of the virtual version of a physical resource, network router, switch, optical device, or computing server, based on an abstracted model of that, which is often achieved by partitioning and or aggregation. Then you, this is the definition of the virtual uh, <coughs> resources. Then if you connect, uh, con uh, connect several virtual resources together and manage it, uh, put it under management of single administrative entity, then you have a virtual infrastructure. There are, this is the definition that we come up with the Giant, but if you look at the Cisco or Juniper, they have their own uh, definition, which is, uh, at the end of the day, uh, conceptually is the same, and there are different in details. Now, why we need an uh, infrastructure virtualization? If you, uh, if you look at from both uh, NREN and uh, eScience point of view, and also from the uh, new generation of the service provider, we see the new type of network-based application are coming where they need a high, uh, large bandwidth. We see HD, IPTV, 3D online gaming, ultra high definition teleproduction, cloud computing, inside remote instrumentation, and so on and so forth. Some of them are uh, basically consumer based, some of them are e science based, and some of them are shared uh, between these two communities. But uh, uh, what they need, they need uh, all of them a uh, profound transformation of the transport network which is coming through the 100G Ethernet and optical network and so on and so forth. And also they need a dynamic network control and management. But uh, uh, one thing they share is uh, the change, the paradigm of the network, which is uh, from the mobility of the petabytes, which you currently see, they are going to see the uh, mobility of the exabyte of the data combined with the processing. So we have a mobility of the data and processing all together uh, coming as a new fashion for each type of application. And they have a, their own requirement for mobility and uh, their own requirement for processing each type of this application. So then uh, it comes for the providers or operator, which makes them for them is not fa uh, feasible to or a scalable for them to build for each category of application uh, a separate infrastructure to satisfy their mobility, data mobility requirement and portion requirement. So the, there is a, is a combined that we can share this facility and isolate the infrastructure for each application. So future internet provider and operator, basically they need a deployment of a dynamic infrastructure capable of supporting all application type 
which each of them, they have their own access and network resource usage pattern or profile. So then you see that the new network technology is a is baseline solution for this. We see the dynamic network control management is coming to support the new network technology and provide for this application uh, uh, the solution on demand. Then we have a convergence of the IP and uh, IT and network infrastructure, which gives the capability of the mobility and processing together. Then uh, these are, are building a new network architecture, which allows the operator to provide that infrastructure as a service uh, for the uh, for the customer or user, and then create a new business models. And to do infrastructure as a service, the key technology enable is a network virtualization. If you have a, a single infrastructure, you have invested a lot, is capable of doing the uh, mobility of the large amount of the data, is a dynamic, and in, then it support the processing at the edge. So you need to combine them together and create the infrastructure as a service portion and sell it to the user or give it to the user and service provider. Then virtualization is a key feature for that, that it can partition the network and give it to the user. Now, going beyond the motivation, I a little bit focus what we have done in Geon3. In Geon3, uh, GR1 Task 4, which is a research activity looking at the uh, virtualization, is a research activity, is very a small task. It's, in fact, it's the smallest task in Geon, and with a limited manpower. What the objective are is first to analyze the current available solutions suitable for NREN and Geon infrastructure virtualization and suggest how they can possibly use them uh, the, we are we supposed to look at the virtualization of the network and IT resources. We look at the virtualization of a node and transport surface virtualization and also computing resource virtualization. And also we're supposed to look at the find a solution for virtualization in the multi-domain environment, which means you, you, we must provide a solution that we can create a single virtual uh, domain comprising from resources from multiple NREN or multiple network resource providers. Now, when we started the task, we did a, a, a homework and tried to look what are the available solutions, uh, which was two years ago. Uh, in two years ago was the beginning of the looking at the infrastructure virtualization solution. And you, we, we specifically see European Com Research Committee has managed to achieve significant progress in infrastructure virtualization technology through several new and ongoing research projects. There are loads of projects ongoing at the moment. Some of them are already finished, and some of them are just is going to start. So all of them are do, looking at the infrastructure virtualization at different layers from different point of view. Uh, and also what we found, which I am going to uh, explain further in detail, that requirement for virtualization service is not common between NREN. If you go to detail of that, what they want to do with virtual, inf virtual infrastructure is different NREN by NREN. And also, uh, in Gion, we found it is not uh, efficient if you want to import, to propose yet another new virtualization technology or framework or mechanism. Uh, loads of them available in Europe, US, Japan, and across Asia and across different con continents. So what we try to do, we try to uh, build a, a Gion virtualization service based on development and achievement of EU project. And finally, try to find a solution that NREN can work, uh, uh, each of them, they choose their own virtualization mechanism, and they can uh, pr uh, in, uh, interwork together under a single umbrella, and can, they can uh, create a virtual infrastructure across a very heterogeneous domain. So going to my uh, previous point that there are loads of solutions available, I have listed uh, here a, a, a very a snapshot of the, uh, what we have extensively reviewed in this task. If you look at, uh, I mean, the, um, uh, the one with the blue are not as specific with, uh, uh, with Europe. I mean, they are mainly uh, US or Japan based. Uh, see GNE, which has a SFA framework and architecture for a slice federation uh, architecture. Then we have Akari, which is multi layer, multi technology virtualization. We have a Pan Lab and Planet Lab doing something in, in, uh, in, in, line, uh, in line with what GNE is doing, but in another direction, which is called TL framework for the uh, Virtualization Infrastructure Federation. We have a, a NOVI, which is looking uh, try to adopt SFA, Virtual Infrastructure and Federation Mechanism. We have a SAIL project, which is a self-management virtual network, layer two and layer three. We have a Gazers project, look at the layer one virtualization, plus computing and storage virtualization. 
We have Ophelia, where, uh, which is look at the layer two and layer one virtualization and computing virtualization. Manticore, we saw uh, previously the presentation, is look at the layer two and layer three virtualization. We, had a, we have a phosphorus, again, provide a solution to some extent for layer one virtualization. We have a Federico, and so on and so forth. But what a good thing we have done the very first year of the project, which is a continuing effort, we managed to create a comprehensive study and uh, do a, um, a comparison study what each of these projects provide and what, is, what each of them are useful for, what are their potential application, what type of the user community they address, and what uh, problem they address. So at the end, we managed to come up with the, this is again a snapshot of the table. The table, both in terms of the row and column, is much, much bigger. You, if you go to the, this public deliverable of this task, you will see a comprehensive comparison table of the all virtualization mechanisms, which is currently active in Europe and US and Japan, and this compare them. Uh, what solution they provide, what protocol they use, and what is benefit and pros and cons of them, and uh, what is the application of them and use case of them. So this has been currently is an active document. We update it continuously, but uh, um, uh, and it has become a reference of the many new project and new uh, research activity across the community. Then what else we did? We tried to analyze the user requirements. <coughs> Uh, we did the initial requirement analysis. We tried to ask for the use case from NRENS and also uh, network research educational, uh, educational research networks and providers and also try to talk with them to see what is the priority for the virtualization. So what was the common which is here? Uh, I am, uh, uh, is coming, the, the main interest in the network virtualization, more or less uh, we see that the, although the operators, the internet operators are shifting toward conversion of the IT and network, and RENA still are uh, struggling to bring the concept of cloud and computing and IT networking to, to the network provisioning. Most of them are interested still on the uh, network virtualization. They see uh, server or computing virtualization something separate. The time scale is interesting. They expect all, uh, more or less all RN that we ask uh, to, uh, to some sort deploy some sort of infrastructure which I explain here uh, by 2012 and then uh, 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 what they also want to see, they want to have a virtualization in a multi-domain environment, not a single domain environment. And then also we want to have a capability to federate their virtual infrastructure with other virtual infrastructures. And they want to see in all sorts of the, uh, layers, from layer two, layer one, and layer three, dif different uh, have a different interest. So according to this study that we did and the questionnaire we then ran, the lesson that we learned was the current virtualization technologies resulting from existing project and framework are still in their research and development stage. You cannot find any framework uh, which is, you say, ma ma mature enough and you can recommend it that is the best. It is therefore not realistic to propose a specific virtualization technology solution to RN or Giant. But what we can do, we can propose an integrated architectural approach that allows different virtualization technology deployed across NREN and Giant and then integrated together. So basically, we allow the NREN to choose the virtualization technology that they want based on the layer of the interest and then they provide them solution to integrate it with the other virtualization mechanism. So then idea of the genus comes, the genus, genus is the architecture is a multi-layer, multi-domain, and multi-technology virtualization architecture suitable for error and geon requirements. Genus, that I have some fact, is not a virtualization mechanism or framework. It leverages on virtualization framework mechanism tool, tools and software already implemented within EU initiative and as well as uh, Giant. Uh, specifically, it uses the Giant bandwidth on demand provisioning system. Genus requires to, for NRENs to adopt their own virtualization mechanism based on their choice and based on their strategic uh, objective. If they want to have a layer one virtualization, layer two, or layer three, or combination of them, there are uh, framework there. They have to choose their own framework. Then NREN and, uh, NREN and GEON backbone network are infrastructure provider of the Genus, and Genus doesn't have itself a resource, basically. Now let's see how the genus works. Basically, what we assume if we have a, a, a one NREN at the, my left-hand side, another NREN at uh, uh, my right-hand side, 
uh, and then it's connected by Giant, of course. And we imagine that in the near future, we will have an automatic bandwidth on demand provisioning on top of Giant, so we can connect them dy uh, dynamically. We expect that the uh, RN1 and RN2, they, they install their own virtualization mechanism. Uh, for example, it can be layer one virtualization based on the Geyser. This can be a layer two virtualization based on Manticore. And then they create their own virtual infrastructure. What the Genius does try to stitch this virtual infrastructure together to homogeneously present it for the user and pass the user requirements to the, uh, to the, this system for creating a multi-domain homogeneous virtual infrastructure uh, as it is for end-to-end -end connectivity uh, between different RN and different resources. I go a little bit further and need to make it clarify, to clarify it further. So basically, the, the big picture that we see, if we have an RNA, for example, if we also, uh, is a, based on L3 domain, we have a Gion, which is in the middle. Then we have an RNB, which is L2 domain or L1 domain. All of them, they have their IT resources, and the IT resources, they want to create a virtual infrastructure to serve the users. So we ask the NREN is expected to deploy their own virtualization mechanism among the existing system. For example, NRNA can use uh, Manticore, which is well developed, uh, or it can use for IT virtualization many available external virtualization mechanisms. Then it can use, uh, for layer two, it can use, for example, open flow based Ophelia. And for IT virtualization, this one can use, again, Ophelia. And then Giant uh, is, uh, we imagine at some point, will move toward Autobahn bandwidth provisioning. Then uh, you see that these all can create the, uh, their virtual infrastructure using their system, and then uh, uh, they, they can request connectivity using the Autobahn, and then you, uh, here also they can create their, their own virtual infrastructure. Then the genus sit on top of it, try to stitch together, and create a, basically a multiple isolated domain which combines the resources among this pool together and create based on the user requirements. Now, if you have a genus system, what is going to happen that you create, a, a, you move a, from the current business model of the RN and, and, a, a, and the Giant a, to a new business model, which, uh, because we have a different lower role here. One, we have a basically classical RN, which is the resource provider. They own the infrastructure, they provide for a service. Uh, then we have a, uh, somebody which has to own the virtual resources or virtual network. And, uh, and then we have a, uh, some entity which has to operate the virtual, uh, virtual resource operator. This can be, of course, all of them single NRN or can be divided between different NRN. We have an NRN in Europe that they are looking to delegate the operation of the virtual, uh, virtual infrastructure to another entity rather than themselves. So in the classical structure, we have a service consumer, infrastructure operator, and infrastructure provider. With virtualization, you will have infrastructure provider, infra virtual infrastructure provider, virtual infrastructure operator, and service consumer. Now, uh, uh, going further into Genus, if we want to implement it, we try to see what is the very, very minimum basic. We don't want to uh, commercially or operationally deploy it, but to make a proof of concept, what is the basic service that we need. We need to uh, somehow to interface with different NRM virtualization mechanisms. We need to in interface with Giant bandwidth on demand provisioning system. Uh, and also, we need to f have uh, several basic elements of service. We need the uh, uh, infrastructure directory to list all the available resources. We need uh, some mechanisms to reserve, to allow the user select and choose and reserve the virtual resources. We need a, a user interface that lets the user in a unified manner across the NRN community defines request, and then this request has to be translated to different uh, uh, virtualization system based on their interfaces. That's why we have an adapter to adopt the user requirements based on different virtualization mechanisms, and then we have an operation and management of virtual infrastructure. If you look at this, uh, I, uh, if I want to have a, a simple example of these resources, if we see these resources, we have an RNA, for example. Imagine RNA is running the Ophelia virtualization framework, which is based on OpenFlow. Then it needs a, uh, it needs a, a Ophelia adapter to talk with the Genus system. Then if RNB 
Imagine uh, we call uh, domain B is a giant. It runs autobahn or bank on demand provisioning. Then we need an autobahn adapter to talk with Genus. And then uh, we have an errand uh, domain, this domain here or this errand here, which uh, run the uh, Manticore virtual agent system. And then we have a, um, um, another adapter for Manticore uh, to talk with this Genus system. Then when, uh, when this adapter represents all the information from this different virtual agent mechanism in a unified format for the Genus system, then we have a resource reservation, a resource listing, which lets the user to see and reserve the resources. And then uh, a unified user interface, which lets the user to go uh, to describe the requirement in terms of the virtual infrastructure in a unified manner. Then we have, when we have a, we create a virtual infrastructure, we have a set of functions to operate and manage for the user the virtual infrastructure. Now, uh, the question comes, how do we implement this? These are the basic things, very minimum, nowhere near to operational services that we need to do. But uh, we have to choose the select approach to go ahead to implement and further develop the services. We can do either centralized based approach, which is in parallel, we are working in the Geon to see uh, how does it go. This is based on the uh, ethical or pan lab or planet lab approach, which is uh, uh, it try to bring everything on a centralized manner and try to uh, get the information from different errands and from the user and try to match them to the virtual infrastructure in, in a centralized manner. Or we can have a semi-distributed manner, or more or less the way that SFA or in USA they are, uh, they are uh, approaching this. So we have a vi different virtualization mechanism in different uh, uh, NREN or GEONT. And then they have their own autonomy or their own point of reference, uh, how to expose the information to a, uh, to a centralized scheduler or centralized resource allocation for allocating resource to the user. These are both approach are currently equally valid. We are getting them in parallel, and we are developing in parallel. Hopefully, by end of this year, we will have a, 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 a some um, um, more concrete conclusion which way we would like to see from Gion to go ahead. Now, uh, concurrent to the uh, to the architecture development, we are building a test bed to validate our architecture. The test bed is currently uh, is uh, under planning and hopefully uh, by September should be operational. It's going to have a, uh, to involve a couple of uh, NREN and emulated bandwidth on demand provisioning domain of the Giant and then a, a simple GNU system with a minimum functionality to try to, uh, in, a uni, in a unified way, uh, make a communication between uh, two or three more virtualization system and a user for setting up the virtual infrastructure in a uh, multi-domain way. The testbed, uh, if we currently set up, is considered three domains, uh, uh, two NREN and one, uh, again, is part of one NREN, but it provides the uh, emulation of the Giant environment. And then it tried to uh, use the uh, on-demand uh, high-definition video streaming as an application use case with different quality of service. We imagine the user wants to run the uh, video streaming with different quality of service, with different processing requirements. For example, you see a network with 150 megabit per second with four CPU processing and four gigabyte, uh, four terabytes, sorry, it should be terabyte of storage, and different sort of quality of service. And then uh, they want to create a virtual infrastructure structure for differently for each of these networks. So basically, we want to use our Genus system and to create a, 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 a broadcasting, video broadcasting, or multicasting uh, streaming mechanism uh, across the uh, couple of NRENs using Genus with different quality of service and uh, different uh, bandwidth requirements. So this is basically uh, uh, our progress so far, uh, half a way through the, this task of the uh, Giant. So we are uh, further working on the architecture and also testbed uh, development to validate the architecture. Hopefully, uh, we, the target is that the next turn now we run a, a demo uh, of the system. Thank you, Reza, for your presentation. Are there any comments to the speaker? Questions? 
If no, I, I have a general comment to your presentation. Uh, you mentioned that NRENs are not directly interested in the virtualization of uh, IT resources. So they are willing to implement virtualization for just for the network part. This, uh, surprise, this surprises me a bit because um, some NRENs uh, have attached big data centers to, to it. And they own, uh, they own the, the data centers. Also, big data centers are, are attached as external resources to the NREN infrastructure. So my question is, what are the position of NRENs towards the cloud computing? What, uh, what is the, yeah. what, what, it's not the question to you, it's yeah. rather to I can to comment on this because that was the question for us in the task as well. The problem is that the virtualization at the network level is very, very new, even for the NREN or outside of the NREN. But the uh, distributor federation and virtualization of computing resources is really old and well studied, especially in science community. So there are very de developed solutions. If you, for example, you want to run an uh, e-science application on the, uh, I don't know, CERN data or uh, uh, at that scale, there are well-defined approach uh, or, or there are well-defined projects that they are very mature and they have. But they don't consider as such the network. They have a network only as a point-to-point -point connectivity. They don't consider a network combined with the IT. So that's the one barrier because there are a very well developed solution for federated computing or the, uh, we call grid computing, uh, but there is uh, not much network considering that. Yeah. I'm a bit concerned whether the NRENs, current NRENs, European NRENs are going to be a part of the game in the cloud computing, providing cloud computing services to our customers or not. We had a discussion on the Monday. There was an uh, uh, ISO both, and we spent a lot of time discussing the role of NRENs in current world and rega uh, with regard to cloud computing infrastructures. In, 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 I mean, one very interesting uh, comment, I mean, our survey found in Europe at least, except uh, two or three NRENs, the rest think about the computing virtualization, even they need it from the Genus system, they want, for example, to virtualize PREF sonar service to run the monitoring system. They don't want to use it as a computing. They want to use it uh, to run a network measurement tool or network control uh, software on top of their infrastructure. They don't want to use it as a cloud or as a computing uh, attached to the service. So this is the current status. Yes. OK, thank you, Reza. Are there any comments to all speakers at the end of of the session. Do you have general remarks and other opinions? If not, uh, before we, uh, I close the session, I would like to make a couple of announcements. Uh, I was asked to do so. So first of all, uh, there are demos performed during breaks and you can find the schedule online and you can find the, uh, the schedule for these demos listed uh, on the screen, LCD screen. So please make sure you are aware of all, them, all of them and attend if you find them interesting. Also, uh, after this session, there, are, there is a poster uh, session uh, till 4 p.m. So authors of posters will be present uh, just in front of this room, uh, ready to address your questions uh, regarding posters. And finally, uh, in the evening, we have extra events. Please make sure you are aware of, of these events. Uh, please check on the website and please attend. And thank you very much for it.